So with the fact that there were lots of grizzlies, that we could still have lots of grizzlies, <clears throat> why don't we have still lots of grizzlies beyond the Great Divide? Uh, an important question if we're going to understand why they went extinct here and what their prospects might be for the future. So to get at that, um, to answer this question, we have to go back in history to a certain extent. And, and to a certain extent as well, this um, plunge into history, especially deep history, is a little bit gratuitous on my part, um, primarily because I'm fascinated with this topic. So, starting with deep history, going back to the last ice age, the Wisconsinan, um, between 70 and 55,000 years ago, which is the early part of this last ice age. Here you're looking at North America tipped down to the south. These blue arrows correspondingly then point to the North Pole. Towards the top, you can see uh, Eastern Siberia peeking in, connected at that time to North America by land exposed uh, by lower sea levels. That water caught up in continental ice sheets. And so by virtue of this exposed land uh, creating Beringia, which then in turn created one vast supercontinent at that time comprised of Eurasia and North America. And this period in time is important because that's when grizzly bears first arrived in North America into Eastern Beringia comprised of three different genetic lineages, clades two, three, and four. And you can think of each one of these clades as being roughly a subspecies Shortly after they arrived, um, thanks to the emergence of ephemeral fleeting ice-free corridors, some of these bears have managed to move south. And of those, the only lineage that survived were clade four grizzly bears. Not long after these clade four grizzly bears arrived and survived, the door literally and figuratively slammed shut with coalescence of the continental ice sheets during the last glacial maximum about 25,000 years ago. And interestingly, at the same time that grizzly bears survived at mid-latitudes, grizzly bears in eastern Beringia apparently went extinct. Looking at the global picture, um, here's in white again where we had continental ice sheets during the last glacial maximum in green is where I reconstruct that we had um, grizzly bears largely relegated to refugia, which were somewhat fragmented, which then allowed for further differentiation of these clades in Siberia, notably uh, clade three, um, giving rise to clades, sub, subclades 3A and 3B. <clears throat> And as you might expect, with warming of the climate and melting of the ice sheets, grizzly bears spread out from these refugia clade three bears, notably heading east through eastern Siberia into western Beringia, or clade four bears spreading east and north. So bringing us back to North America, the beginning of our current warm epoch about 11,500 years ago, the ice sheets were rapidly melting an ice-free corridor was correspondingly rapidly emerging and widening. We have the arrival of these clade three bears from central Siberia into Beringia um, just shortly before it was sundered by the merging oceans. These clade three bears headed south into the ice-free corridor. Our clade four bears, meanwhile, heading north, these two clades met and mingled in what was to become central Alberta. Now importantly, clade three bears never got any further south. The upshot being that all the bears that we still have once had at mid latitudes in North America are of clade four bears, bears descended from the very first wave of grizzlies migrating onto this continent. And also importantly, clade four bears have gone extinct everywhere else on Earth, except at these mid-latitudes in North America, and also with the exception of a single isolate on the Japanese island of Hokkaido. So from this, we can uh, reasonably conclude that we have some extraordinarily special, even unique bears here on our continent in this area, currently of a much endangered clade. 
So this is how things settled out probably about 2,000 years ago after some waxing and waning in the distribution of grizzly bears. So, bringing me to more recent history, starting with when bears encountered Europeans. And for good or for bad, that encounter uh, turned into an ecological holocaust, not only for grizzly bears, but all, for all sorts of animals and plants on this continent. So briefly going through then the history of the consequences of that um, encounter with Europeans starting in 1800. In green, this is where I reconstruct. We had grizzly bears in the contiguous U.S. 1800 uh, momentous because this is when grizzly bears were first encountering significant numbers of Europeans. Fifty years after that, grizzly bears had been extirpated from roughly 10% of the places where they lived. Uh, all the places in yellow largely gone from the central and southern plains. Sixty years after that, they had been extirpated from a little in excess of 90% of the places where they had once lived reduced to populations represented by these green dots and blobs. Some of these populations at the time no more than a few individuals. And then 60 years after that, grizzly bears were reduced largely to these areas represented in green, largely where we have them now, the northern continental divide adjacent Cabinet Yak, Selkirks, Greater Yellowstone, um, also a few bears hanging on in the North Cascades, and also in the San Juan Mountains of Colorado, at least until the 1970s. The reasons for this rapid extirpation of grizzly bears for most of the places where they lived is pretty straightforward. It had to do with Europeans armed with lar large caliber firearms, with bad attitudes, informed by lethal narratives such as Manifest Destiny, which at least in the minds of our European ancestors, gave themselves permission to perpetrate gen genocides against bison, native peoples, wolves, grizzly bears, giving rise to this tedious montage of Europeans standing by or over grizzly bears. They had shot perhaps none more famous than Custer standing over the grizzly bear or behind the grizzly bear in a cat classic trophy shot that he had killed in the Black Hills of South Dakota. So at least at a broad scale, it's pretty un unambiguous why we lost as many grizzly bears as we did in the northern Rockies and also central Idaho, but it still doesn't explain that anomaly, why grizzly bears survived in the northern continental divide and in greater Yellowstone, but not in central Idaho, which was perhaps even more remote and untrammeled than those other two ecosystems. And so to answer that question at a finer scale, we need to look at diet. Starting with the economies, the dietary economies of grizzly bears at about the time of first contact with Europeans. So emblematic of that here in green is where we have an abundance of berry producing shrubs. The darker the green, the greater the diversity and abundance of those shrubs. So you can see that the greatest abundance of berries is probably in central Idaho, adjacent Oregon, northwestern Montana. And in the far northern part of this area of abundant berries, we had a system that was and continues to be organized largely around consumption of huckleberries. South of there, we had a system centered on consumption of spawning salmon and steelhead. Moving east, we picked up a mountain economy um, in which grizzly bears consumed significant amounts of whitebark pine seeds, also some army cutworm moths. <coughs> to the south, an oak-centric economy, acorns largely from gamble oak. And then farther east, an economy pretty unambiguously centered on scavenging the vast herds of bison. But of relevance to our story, particularly of relevance to our story, is consumption of salmon. Uh, 
And we know that everywhere in this area of pink, that salmon were central to the diet of grizzly bears, perhaps critically important to grizzly bears. And we know this from the work of Grant Hildebrandt, who um, collected tissues from the remains of bears that had been killed during the late 1800s, early 1900s, and based on the analysis of stable isotopes, was able to estimate the fraction of the bears and integrated energy and nutrients that came from uh, marine animals, specifically spawning salmon and steelhead. So each one of these percentages corresponds with a specimen um, representing then again the percent of integrated or incorporated energy and nutrients that came from salmon. You can see anywhere from 25 to 90 percent. So again emphasizing that salmon were a critically important food for bears in central Idaho and in areas farther to the so bringing this home specifically to the Northern Rockies, these various dietary economies, notice the coincidence of this salmon system with the grizzly bear promised land, this area where grizzly bears went extinct and where we yet have ample potential. Um, as all of you know, we lost salmon, but interestingly, not until after we had already lost grizzly bears. So we can't implicate the loss of salmon as such in the lo loss of grizzly bears in this part of the world. So something else must have been going on. So again, here's where we had grizzly bears 1910, um, at least where we had them left as of 1910, realizing that um, much of the extirpations um, that in total were to happen had already transpired. So what might explain this patchwork of populations as of 1910? Um, here we're looking at in orange, shades of orange, a representation of densities of people. Um, so you can see that there is a non-overlap of where we had grizzly bears in 1910 with where we had lots of people that might explain to some extent um, the persistence of grizzly bears in the northern continental divide and greater Yellowstone and even the Clearwater, but not most of central Idaho. So something else might have been going on. And so the area in question being here in particular. Here's where we had human densities as of 1930. Again, this doesn't explain where we still had grizzly bears and where we lost them, again, specifically in central Idaho. But what we do have is a fairly dramatic correlation spatially between where we had this premature loss of grizzlies, if you will, and where we had salmon. So again, why would salmon, especially persisting salmon spawning runs, be a factor in the accelerated loss of grizzly bears in otherwise remote country. So importantly, <clears throat> thinking about what goes on along salmon spawning streams, and we know this from areas where we still have grizzlies and spawning salmon, um, given the importance, the centrality of salmon to the diet of grizzly bears in central Idaho at one time, when salmon were available, Grizzly bears concentrated in predictable places at predictable times. And because of that, as it turns out, they were highly vulnerable to bear hunters, such as William Wright. And he has numerous accounts of encountering grizzly bears fishing for spawning salmon along spawning streams, and in most instances, instances resulting in the death of that bear. And uh, as it turns out, William Wright alone was estimated to be responsible for the deaths of perhaps 100 grizzly bears. Emblematic of one of these encounters, um, here's a quote from William Wright's book um, based on an encounter with three grizzlies fishing for salmons um, in a small stream. And here's what happened. I accordingly fired at the small bear and hitting him square in the shoulder, he dropped promptly and without a murmur 
but he dropped into the pool. Before the other one on the log had time to make much of an investigation, I hit him near the same place, but a little further back, and he made for the shore. I paid no attention to him as I knew that he was fatally wounded and would not go far, and slapping my third cartridge in place, I turned to look for the third bear, but all I could see was the swaying of bushes where he had disappeared. The second one shot went some fifty yards after reaching the bank when he fell and was quite dead when I got to him. So here you have an especially lethal human encountering bears at a predictable time and place fishing for salmon. And I would suspect that this scenario played out over and over and over again involving other people such as William Wright. By contrast to salmon, we have other sorts of foods, such as whitebark pine. Um, whereas salmon are concentrated along river or stream systems at lower elevations, where people tend to be active, um, whitebark pine, which is a source of rich bear food as well in the form of high fat content seeds, is well distributed and dispersed at the very highest elevations, tending to be quite remote from where people tend to be active. Um, with a predictable consequence um, in terms of the pace at which, which extirpations happened in the United States between 1850 and um, More specifically, <clears throat> research by Troy Merrill and I looking at drivers of these extirpations noted a striking correlation between where grizzly bears persisted and where they had access to whitebark pine. So what we have um, in these two XY diagrams for two different time periods, 1850 to 1920, 1920 to 1970, um, uh, odds of grizzly bears having survived in a specific area along the west, the X, excuse me, the Y axis, um, the further up the y-axis you go, the greater the odds that the bears would have survived there um, versus increasing abundance of whitebark pine from left to right on the x-axis. And again, you can see that during both uh, transitions or intervals, we had a strong positive correlation between where we had whitebark pine and where grizzly bears survived. This in marked contrast to um, the decline, the rapid decline of grizzly bears, especially during the later period in areas where we had salmon. So we come up with a, I think, a generalizable principle that um, where we have a preponderance of foods at high elevations that are remote, bears tend to be secure and they tend to survive. By contrast, in instances where we have most rich foods concentrated at low elevations in predictable times and places, as was the case with salmon, bears tend to be more exposed to humans, which becomes very problematic when those humans are lethal. So we have the paradox of perhaps salmon not helping grizzly bears persist, but rather accelerating their demise. So again, a little more abstractly, diet, um, configures exposure to humans, which interacts with how lethal those humans might be to determine largely the number of bears that die, given that just about all the bears that die and continue to die actually uh, die from human causes. And so during that period of 1850 to around 1940, <clears throat> we had a particularly problematic circumstance of bears consuming salmon and exposed to highly lethal people in what I'm calling the grizzly bear promised land, central Idaho.